So for this evening, um, we're welcoming Adrienne Ravel here for her reading uh, to celebrate her book, What Was It For? Um, I invite you to look at the program, to visit um, her, to look at the reviews that have been written about her, to follow her on Twitter, she's a great Twitter feed. And I'm only going to, uh, and if you don't know, she also is a contributor to the New Yorker online, and she has some great articles. I'm just going to read you the titles because they're so fun. Um, Why adults are buying coloring books for themselves, the startling poetry of a nearly forgotten Japanese modernist, which is a great article, by the way. I'm not going to tell you who, you'll have to find out. Bento boxes and the grade school power lunch. Curious George learns about brand recognition. <laughs> but tonight, it is her poetry that we celebrate. I'm going to read one, cute, uh, one quote from her publisher because it explains her work so well. In her debut collection, What Was It For?, Adrienne Raphael revitalizes topsy-turvy lyric and its evergreen sagacity. Through playground doggerel charm and riddle, these poems cry fair and foul to a world where pate geese dabble in fields of lavender, crises get wallpapered over, hot air balloons stalk pleasurably, cash changes for gold, and the moon sinks into the sea to the thrum of the metronome. The world is this, our own and only, so reader, climb aboard. Like a carousel, each poem loops round and round, granting dizzying vistas. All the while, these poems spill over with wonder as inquiry, as in jubilee, just as a child chants, why, but why, but why? By way of answer, what was it for offers an immortal, resounding question. Poet Kathy Parkong selected it as the winner of the Black Box Poetry Prize. So I don't want to wait any longer. Welcome. Thank you so much, Sharon, for that extraordinarily generous introduction. And thank you all for coming. This is such, such an honor to be here and with all of you um, in this place I love so much. Um, I, I wanted to start um, because my grandmother is here. <laughs> um, with It's not the first poem in the book, but it's the first poem chronologically that I wrote um, that ended up in the book. And it's set in Atlantic City, where um, we're from. And it's called Boardwalk Block. <laughs> if you're following along in the audience, <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> Boardwalk block. Big Bop Pop's got his five buck shop, chock a block stocked with stuff that's hocked. Watches stopped at the two o'clock, hockey puck hermit crab's legs popped marked. Big Bop Pop's got a lemon pie grin for the ring-a-ding pinball crowd reeling with gin. For the pinstripe belly boys, lips pasty thin, they stop by the shop but they never come in. Big Bop will trade a B flat for a B, a neck for a neck, a tooth for a T, a downy quilt bed bug for a fur cap fat flea, a kick line of one, the knobbly need. Big Bop Pop's got an arcade claw that prized up the filling from the hole in his jaw, bobbled around like a brassy gumball and dropped it again near a rabbit's foot paw. Big Bop Pop's got a nose like the flu, loose elbows goosed with stale crazy glue. If you need eyes, he's got some that'll do. They used to be blue, but he's secondhand new. <laughs> This next poem is called Balloon Boys, to go with alliteration. <laughs> Balloon Boys. One flew into the mountain, one flew into the sea. A third boy flew into Bismarck, not into the Swedish embassy. 
No one dies in the mountain, no one dies in the sea. They're already dead in Bismarck, the embassies closed today. Whose boy flew over the mountain, everything's under the sun. Real boys stick out their necks, the sun is rising the jungle. That boy flies over the canopy, silk pajamas, polka dots, goggles for a balloon, and trumpets of elephant horn. Your boy is reading a newspaper, a thousand years old, soft as cloth. The other boy is practicing the origami goose on a thousand dollar bill. Boy, there's a gold brick strapped to your chest, dent in your chest, the shape of a brick. The straps are made of leather, they're smoother than your skin. Boy, chief evangelist of the oracle, are you an angel investing everything in 60 women in red and 120 sticks? Also, that boy has a regression. He's in the German cavalry, he's high up, he's Bismarck. That boy is a genius, but our boy flew a plane. Our cargo hold is packed with thousands of long-stemmed roses we grew in flower farms. They need to be ready for us, boy, by Valentine's Day. You'll make the roses happen. We locked in our price in November. The boy flies a plane into the UN to see what it's like in India, Indonesia, Iran, if it's the same time in Chile as in Nova Scotia. In Hawaii, it's yesterday. Who's got a Victrola in the balloon? The only record is clay. Put it in the Victrola and put on the needle. The vowels sag down in the middle. Our boy shot the last pigeon. We think it's in the bay. Let's rot here in the marshes. Boy, it's good to be a bum. Shatter the boys into a thousand affordably gorgeous aqua blues. Find me an oasis. Life is under the seat. But what will we do? But what will we do when the rain doesn't come? All of us waiting in everyday slippers. The sidewalk is soaked and there's nothing to do. Have you turned off the invisible fences? But what will we do with our pink lemonade when the trucks double parked get cracked in the mud? The gravestones with headlines and golf balls. I like to go into the soggy, weird leaf meal. Singles on a mixed bench, pockets on the sly. Horse and Wendy Blackbird basking out to dry. Wendy's eye was open, burst into a ring. Waste not, want not, deign to dish. Waste not, want not, deign. What will this all be before it's the calendar? The walker scrapes loud in the swollen dark hallway. Your feet are so swollen, your ankles are gone. What will we do with the light in the freezer? What will the soil, so sorry the soil, once you find where it's open, it's well nigh on time. Upturn the mulcher, the mulch here is darker, the cedar goes plush in the tangled up weather. But what will we do with magnificent playbills? We live for the weather, we drive through the trees. But where are the trees of the electrical sockets? Where are the laws of the thermostat timers? Hum, Peter, dum, Peter, Saturnine ball. Hung patterns, dumped maddens, haddocks, and all. Awful at ping pong, he'll soon make amends. Good riddance to Peter, play tennis again. Why are you working? The lights aren't up yet. Where are they going? The crumpled out faces. Hey, trolley lolly, hey, nanny nay. I'm not going anywhere, everything is on sale. The tree thick with chirping without any sparrows. The church full of honking without any geese. Duck yellow, lemon yellow, gray yellow, gosling. Things getting closer, I'll turn on the heat. Here's the old riddle, scatter the vittles. Cowards junked up the old moon. Thucydides left to the sea full of port and we splashed him away with our spoons. The heat, it turns out, has been on the whole time. What will we do when the pipes are all hissing? What will we do when the piper starts hissing? Don't let the rats come. It's not time to start that. Spit in the sink and wash it down clockwise. Which way does a drain go in this hemisphere? I need a new watch, but I don't really need one. What is the ratio of stars to rats? Are you OK? Are you, are you OK? Are you hello? Will they take down the birds? Five for $10 for all of these flashlights all on the boardwalk, where are their shills? 
Freckle-faced moppets spit on the war, curse Eden in curses slurred spray. A long-handled spider climbed down her ladder and met us almost halfway. <laughs> um, so this is the um, opening poem in this book, um, and Shara mentioned about the geese in the introduction, so I thought I'd let them fly in. Note from Paradise. Somewhere in a Spain I think of as France, dozens of geese live in paradise. They run at the river, swaying their sizable livers, while on either side I think there are fields and fields, or one of lavender faced blue toward the sun, lavender first and by far. It is late summer, early winter, that spleenish November, another idea altogether. It was something like flying well. It was very like something, the geese with their orange oversexed feet bumping each other, and enormous grasshoppers leaping, clutching their back haunches. In every way, this is the peaceable kingdom. The geese are livers. It's fall. It's spring. Things migrate here. It's too far. Also the grass, too hot by far. A mushroom flaps around a stumpy tree, underbelly brown where it hits the sun. Something supposed to be seen is seen. Something supposed. Into the grasses, into the wheat, the worms have got into the flower. The green, green worms in their bright, bright skin, colors berserk in the heat. Leap in the bergamot, latch to the barley corn, leap to the three-pointed clover. No crops here, cropped close as your lover, no time here to look corn. What am I but a half-life? What do I do but I have to do to face these fields where they are lavender first and by far? I'm going to read a slightly longer poem now, um, and then I'm going to read a couple of new poems, and then I'm going to dive back into the book. Imogen and the Beginning of Color. Imogen had a glass tank and one fish. She loved to look at her fish, slept that she might dream of her fish, looked away for the bounding pleasure of seeing it again. One day, Imogen went to the river to gather new water. She set out up the hill and down the hill and over the field and down to the river. Imogen peered into her face and saw the most extraordinary thing, a fish as marvelous as her own. Imogen dipped her bucket into the river in the new fish swam. When she poured the new water in went the fish into the tank. The fish circled the fish. Imogen gasped in wonder. One was light, one dark. One would always be light, one would always be dark. And for a time, her delight doubled. Are there light fish, dark fish, lighter? lightest, darker, darkest, across the field. In her eyes, in the river, fish. Imogen dipped her bucket into the water. When she poured the new fish into the tank, red, yellow, what other fish? Fourth, blue, green. Another fish, yellow, red, yellow, fish, red. Blue fish made the blue, green, green. Brown fish, purple fish, pink fish, orange fish, one gray fish. Imogen had all the fundamental fish. Gray, orange, pink, brown, purple, blue, green, yellow, red, white, black. The gray fish was all over grayish. Red, every reddish, pink, pinkish Imogen was. All of these forms in her tank and Imogen, up the hill, down the hill, over the field, down the river, across the river, along the bank, up the meadow, down through the glade, and up went her bucket, and over the dunes, and down by the sands to the sea. There were fish like her fish. For a time, it was enough to there, she did not see. This was what she had not known she wanted. Dunes, glade, meadow, bank, meadow, bank, river, glade, dun, glad, back, tan, the water made room for an octopus.
It was not gray, not orange, not pink, purple, brown, blue, green, yellow, red, white, black, slid on and off the octopus, all color, no color. The fish refracted. The octopus brooded. One morning, the gray fish, not grayish, but gone. Orange fish, gone. Pink fish, purple, gone. Brown, gone. Watch the octopus by watching around it. One by one, one by one, fewer colors, fewer and fewer. But there, there, no more octopus. Blue fish gone, green and yellow and red, green, yellow, red, and all the light in one of the fish and all the dark in the other. Imogen looked at one fish, looked at the other, no other. There was one fish in the tank. When it swam in her face in the glass, what a marvelous fish. Imogen watched it in unnamed colors. I think I'll read two new poems that newish poems that are in this collection. This one's called The Gardener. She thought she saw a motion unwind a spool of thread. She looked again and found it was her feet that had gone dead. She thought she felt a clarity upon the middle shelf. She felt again and found it was only a second self. She tried to dig a rosebud to plant against the wall. She dug again and found she dug. Where has the soil gone? She tried to be a root until she found another start. She tried again but only got tied up in other knots. She thought she felt BB. She closed her eyes to see. She looked again and found it was her own name in a tree. She thought she was a party girl, party parasol. She looked again and found it was a party after all. She thought she saw the angels standing at the door. She looked again and found it was the angels at the door. I'm waiting out my feet, she said. I won't go to my head. The worst is yet to come, she said. I wonder what it's like. Let's party in the garden. We have to get so small. The robins look like swallows. I'm nowhere near relief. It's better that it's gone, she said. The earth is awfully small. Um. We started in Atlantic City. I'm going to take you across the coast briefly to LA. This is Tiffany Bridal Shop and other prom dresses. Hello. I am Tiffany, a mannequin. I live on 77 Sunset. I would like to read a poem by my very favorite poet, you. That dress is cocktail white. That dress is you. This dress is another blue. My day is $30. My dress is $30,000. No, your birthstone. Mine is aquamarine. Today's horoscope is mean. Something new awaits you. Are you born under a moon sign? Funny. Living curiosity since 32, been on sunset since six, the sun is just as fine, it looks like it's nine, it's true that it's nine for you, you'll never get out of your time, what time is it? I live in a shoe, you do too, spectacular. This flower is hope, there's no artificial light, it's neon, ever been so bright before? Nope. Nothing is as crimson as you. No, nothing is cleaner than an aquatic feature. Stand in the middle and reckon you look like a four-year-old princess. Better off Becky, baby zinc, pup in pink. Yesterday was St. Benjamin's Day. April Fools, you're the saint. Did we get you? What do you think you want to do, little shoe? That juice is ten. Knock, knock. Want to be beautiful? Your nails are weak. You need keratin, long-lasting, garçon, mystique. You're a star. It's the best thing. Whatever you choose, it's you. Um, I'll go back. Back to this. Back to Atlantic City. <laughs> Agar, agar, or agar, 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 agar. 
Little star, today I am gelatin. I make a mold of my body cavity. The doorbell rings, I go outside. The sky is pink gelatin. Welcome to Vacation Island. The doorbell rings, I go close and leave my body behind. Welcome to Vacation Island. The sun anneals me torso pink. Wonderful to be so close, pliant and pink by the sea. The sun anneals me bubble gum. I run on the boardwalk, the end of the boardwalk. I bounce and I bounce where the boardwalk is aluminum, I have to reach it. I run past the same magnificent houses, aluminum boned and stucco laced, Juliet balconies, Doric, Ionic, magnificent stucco, tiny plots, picture window walls globular to the sea, ironwork alabaster and abalone statues and the famous acorn by the sea. The color block windbreaker trio, marvelous socks stretched to the knees, summer to the skin and rotisserie women, puffy people waiting, slathered in something gunky, elaborate bits of neoprene, all kinds of people on all the tattoos in places and marshmallow folds. I've never been so translucent, never so runny. The white hot sand makes my feet pinker. What part of me will I tattoo? I can go so far and farther. On the carousel. This is a carousel spell, subject, object, carousel. 20 performances of carousel. I didn't wear glasses in carousel. There was that diner, tinned Caruso. Diner is not right. The right word, well, it's not worth it to ride the carousel when there is a tilt-a-whirl. Lost worlds under the carousel. Lost the bet, lost the battle, better not lose the carousel. Hear, hear a wishing well, I'll wish for a carousel. Picture you in a beanie, whirly gig, triple timing the carousel. Rotisserie chicken that didn't sell, you always cried at carousel. Parlez-vous? Not at all, only on the carousel. Picture the place du carousel, you've got it wrong, no carousel. You're in Paris, I'm in De Gaulle, my luggage still on the carousel. Weather vane, no wherewithal, terrible little carousel. Too much thunder, a sudden squall scares the horses off. They run away in parallel, still to the tune of the carousel. No carousing in the capital, no crowding on the carousel. This is not a carousal. To Caravaggio, this carousel must be forged. Carousel, Trump Loy trumps a painted carousel. Who's there? Who's there? Who's there? Pray tell, oh, too, too solid carousel. I am too much in the sun, a ray full of doggerel, still on, on, on the carousel. Glockenspiel. Driving home from the eye doctor, I see so clearly. This little island has got so crowded, I have to stand in line at the pharmacy. The swans are standing in their line. The swans are standing in their line, waiting to pay for their pills. I don't live here anymore. I live on little Volkelia Island. The cat has died, it has come back to live with me. The cat's name is Lime Drink. I used to drive the tunnel home, I drove at night. I drove day and night, day and night, so crowded. The only time that's worth it is between A and A. I used to need two keys to unlock, but now I have a doorbell. Look, that's me in knickerbockers. Look, the frozen bay is the color of old film and Werther's. There could be blocks of ice. The other thing I do is, I did the jumble two ways and both ways were right. I got verse and lived and ranked and veined and envied and danker and devil and sever. Jeopardy is still on at the same time offshore. All the channels are the same except in the 200s. Five years of Lorna Dune sitting on the shelf, getting more expensive the sooner they expire. Um, I think I'll read two more poems, and then um, if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you all again for being here. It's... 
the ambassador. I am the ambassador to Paris, China. I took a gondola to Tibet. Wonderful wedding light, so clean I can't breathe. I am the ambassador to the boy with a curse from the old country. His hands press his chest. What about Ouija boards? I burned one in the park. The middle of America, the malls decay and fall. Big mouth billy bass sings on the wall. Zambonis gold with mold, fish tanks filled with stuff. The Colosseum was a woods until it was the Colosseum. I have an ambassadorship, it's a token. I ambassador monopoly. I'm the banker and I embargo everything. The edges of America, the malls decay and fall. Big mouth Billy Bass moans on the wall. Zambonis plastic from Japan, fish tanks empty, cracked. The Coliseum is alive tonight with many hungry men. I am the ambassador to a crash. They give me a bomb to hold. They also give me a Ouija board. It's not the one you sold. Empire America, something decays, falls. Big mouth Billy Bass shrieks on the wall. Sibyls on Zambonis, fish tanks filled with gods. The Coliseum is for rent. You'd better get in line. I'm your astrological ambassador. I found you in another mind. You've been there a long time. You're here, too. The porches of America, sidewalks strip and fall. Big mouth Billy Bass thumps on the wall. Fur-tailed dogs chase plastic balls, fish tanks stuffed with men. Magnets of the Coliseum waiting for the fridge. The metros of America, escalators fall. Big mouth Billy Bass is silent on the wall. Cathedral Nova Zembla. Fish tanks blank with gunk. Coliseum credit card, you haven't got a check. And I'll end with this poem. Um, the form just builds on itself. And um, it's called The House on Bay Shore. My mom. <laughs> the House on Bay Shore. This is the house on Bay Shore. This is the bulkhead behind the house on Bay Shore. This is the dock that joins the bulkhead behind the house on Bayshore. This is the Dalmatian that hates the dock that juts from the bulkhead behind the house on Bayshore. This is the crusted red sore on the foot of the dog that hates the dock that juts from the bulkhead behind the house on Bayshore. This is the showcase showdown, the sore and the Dalmatian who licks the sore and barks at the dock that gives a Bronx cheer to the bulkhead that keeps out the bay from 2425 Bayshore. This is the sunroom stuffed with the showcase showdown stuff and the minty chew thing the dog ignores to lick the Procrustean yellowed sore that throbs at the dock that's rotting behind the bulkhead behind the house on Bayshore. This is more stuff than ever before, the stuff that's behind doors one, two, three in the showcase showdown seen on TV, raw chew things, plastic Easter eggs, the sore that's gone minty that hobbles the dog so she can't get at the dock that's above the tide that's below the bulkhead that keeps out the bay from the bay shore. This is the hurricane that welled up the house and spoiled the stuff in the showcase showdown with the salt that soaked through everything. Thank God the dog's dead. The dock is displayed and the bulkheads washed up in parallel parking. And who will get the wooden white whale hung by the door of the front of the house on bay shore? This is the house that went into dumpsters that sat in the driveway behind the full set of the World Book Britannica, red birds in shoeboxes, fake Christmas tree without lights attached, in a room from the showcase, unopened inner tube from QVC, the Dalmatian ornaments, an electronic globe that fell off the L in the bay by the bulkhead behind the house. That's a lot on Bay Shore. This is the start of a four-story house with foundations on top of the showcase showdown. Keep the old Easter eggs, stars on their shells, the dead dotted dogs downward of the dock that never did nothing to nobody see. The cockroach comes up from under the lot and jumps over the bulkhead with sudden alacrity, runs at the water as fast as the end of the alphabet can at the end of Bayshore.
Thank you. piece I can be um, talking to people you're writing in sentences it's a, a, like a conversation between people and trying to put together something very clearly when I'm writing a poem um, it's often a lot more about like um, juxtaposing sounds or images that I don't know why they're being juxtaposed together but like um, yeah I think they they to me they kind of draw from similar places, but they complement each other. It's nice to be like it's nice to go back and forth. I think if I were just trying to write poems all the time, that would put a lot of pressure on the poems. And if I were just trying to write nonfiction all the time, I I I, I, I don't know, <laughs> you know. So it's a nice. It provides counterbalance, and it's different, it's similar in different kinds of work. Social life. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm gonna just def 
for something, you know. I, um, that the group of people in my year and in the years around me, um, we just very much connected and so like we have, we you know, we share, we're sharing work all the time and we were also, you know, just having long conversations about nothing all the time. So, it, yeah, so. <laughs> when they don't, you know, claw out each other's eyes, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, well, I know that you, I know you read widely from poets of many different eras, but I'm wondering whom you're currently reading a lot of uh, among contemporary poets who choose to um, experiment with innovative wordplay. Among contemporary poets. <laughs> Who's your gonna quiz me? <laughs> Um, there's, um, I mean, it's like, I, I sort of feel funny of answering, like, a lot of what my friends are doing, um, is similar work. Like, I, I was, I was doing a reading last night with this poet, Daniel Popek, who's kind of doing, um, word, play more image based. Um, there's a poet, Anthony Madrid, who now lives in Texas, who is, like, if you think my poems are sort of insanely formal musically, this guy is just like off the charts. He made the, like, he, he's um, doing like insanely Baroque kind of limericky stuff. Um, um, I mean, Robin Schiff is a contemporary poet who I'd point to who is doing a lot of um, really fascinating work with words um, and, um, Jeffrey Nutter in a sort of, um, his work is much sort of simpler on the surface, but it's very song-like and he'll often, he'll often sing in readings and he's one of the few people I have heard do that where I'm just not completely um, turned off by him singing his poems. It actually works somehow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Hi. Um, my sister wrote poems that she, um, years ago, and they were performed as music with mm -hmm. a musician. Um, mm -hmm. And it was lovely. And oh. I, as you were remind, remind, reminding me when you were reading of, of that, that uh, collaboration, it was beautiful. And I thought, I didn't know, you know what your, you know, your inspirations were and what, who you were reading, but, but I kept thinking how incredibly musical this is and um, beautifully constructed, but so musically. Oh. I, I, didn't, I haven't heard that before. It's just I was, this is the first time I've heard this poetry in this way, and um, I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, and I mean, I think that, um, like, as I was saying, like, often poems kind of start for me in sound, and, you know, you, um, go back to kind of like histories of poetry, right? That's like where the poems begin often is in music and in recitation and in poems, like they have to be nuggets that you can remember so you can like go into the meat hall and recite or sing these poems. So they have to be something that sticks inside of you and then so they have to be constructed via music. And um, yeah, that's, I, I feel like and I feel like the only test for me of when a poem is working 
or not is and is when I read it out loud. Like it can be doing stuff on the page that I'm like, wow, that looks really cool. Oh, wow, great! Like that's cool. Um, and then I read it out loud, and it, it for you know. The meter is way too regular, the meter's not regular enough, the like the sounds just aren't working with each other, like it's all too thought out, it's not thought out enough. Um, yeah. Uh, obviously you're a very talented poet already. Do you have an idea of what the future might look for you in terms of what you can see of progress? How if we listen to you in ten years, what would you like to talk to you different? I swear I didn't put it onto this. <laughs> Um, a couple of my professors, um, well, one of my professors, Mark Levine, who's also an excellent, a really excellent formal poet, um, he likes to say that if the second book sounds like anything like the first book, then, like, why, why bother that it's over then, you know? Or, like, um, I think for me, what I want my poetry to sound like in 10 years, I don't, I, want it to sound um, not like this, but not in a rejection of this, something that grows um, forward and knows how to do more things. And it's just, um, you know, and it's funny for me to read from this book sometimes, you know, the Boardwalk blog I wrote in 2008, um, and uh, some of these poems I wrote, you know, over the course of many years. So even this book, I'm going in and thinking, oh my God, that was, I have to now inhabit this self I was five years ago, and that's a funny plate, that's a funny navigation. So um, yeah, I, I would hope that it would sound of the same voice, but you don't know what the voice is going to say. You have no idea what, what, what well, like, like, uh, your poetry is obviously different than, say, T.S. Eliot. <laughs> <laughs> but I love T.S. Eliot. Do well, I mean, you have an idea of, uh, he's not one of your, your goals, I guess. You have other inspirational goals of your own that don't lead the direction of T.S. Eliot or other poets, I think. Well, actually, T.S. Eliot, actually, to follow up on that question, he is kind of a goal because, um, I've heard a professor say this, and I think it's really true. He never wrote the same poem twice. Like, he wrote Proof Rock, but then he didn't write five million other poems that are like that. He then went and wrote another kind of poem, another kind of poem. And I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I <laughs> Elliot's a goal, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so is Marianne Moore, so is Gerard Manley Hopkins, so is Emily Dickinson and Robert Frost. Um, I could write. Poems that sound like Robert Frost, and you know, probably the, like every, you know, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Um, I have a very good friend. I have a very good friend who's a musician, and it's very easy to talk to her about um, structure and writing because, like the way she's thinking about music. It's the same way that I'm thinking about poems. Yeah. You mentioned reading poems aloud. Would you recommend that when we're when we have a poem in front of us that it's best to read it out loud? In contrast to when you're reading other things you read it silently. Yes, yes. Um, and often um, I, I have, often when I'm teaching, I'll ask students to memorize poems, and it really, um, it's common to do, but it's, it's really just a different way of getting to know a poem. Then you internalize it. Um, and it's, it's, so yes, read it out loud and keep going. And memorize. Yeah. <laughs> Homework. <laughs> yeah, Wendy. Um, so I, I'm astounded. This is amazing. Um, I, I have a very sort of analytical brain. I don't feel like I have whatever gene you have that does this sort of thing. So, so in my mind, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to write a poem. It's going to be about this, right? Okay. 
<laughs> and, then, and then I'm going to start writing about it, and you know, because there's a point to that poem. Like I'm thinking, I'm going to write a poem. I, and so, does that ever happen to you? Like I want to write a poem about something. I just don't know what it's going to sound like. Or are you, as you were saying before, you have a a musical thing, and you're just going to take it, and you're going to go somewhere, and you don't even know what that poem is going to be about. I think it's a really good question, and it's a tricky one, because on the one hand, if I know what a poem is about, or actually if I know what any piece of writing is really about before I go into it, then it's like, then what's the purpose of writing? And if I know it's already there, then like, you know, so you figure it out. But I think what can be, um, like, where it feels important to like listen to what the poem wants to do. It's like, okay, I have an idea of I think what I want to write this poem about, so I'll start in with that. But then as you're writing, you realize, oh, the poem doesn't want to be about that. It actually wants to be about something else. And then you start writing that, you're like, oh, no, no, the poem wants to be about something else. And then, like, I think the hard part, at least for me, the hard part is like, sticking with that and hanging on to it and listening and saying, you know, no, it would be so much easier if this poem just wanted to be about this one thing that I thought it wanted to be about, but it's taking me into this place that it's uncomfortable and that's, that I have to go into that and not, and then like go into what that's about and not take the exit ramp. So I think like, yeah, I, I, I've been trying to experiment more with going into a poem thinking, oh, this might be a thing I think I want to write about, but then like, okay, where, what do I, but then like the, I don't know, some, maybe it's psychoanalysis and poetry, like what am I actually, what do I actually want to write about? And that's the thing I don't know. So like discovering what I don't know, that has to happen for me through the writing. Do you, do you always, I mean, do you always know what your poems are about? I never know what my poems are about. <laughs> I mean, you're done with them, or sometimes you, you sort of know what they're about, but you, you also like the way they sound, or maybe maybe later they seem to be about something that they didn't they weren't about before. Do you always kind of like you're done with it, and we may not really get what it's about, but you really know? Oh no, no, that's what friends are for, and that's what readers are for, and that's what you guys are for, that's what an audience is for, you know. And I feel like I do this with my friends' poems, I, or like with um, anyone else's poems, or even with. Um, Keats's poems, with Blake's poems, you know, you read them and you start thinking, okay, what is this about? But I can't do that to mine, but then I can have a conversation with people and then they see things and they're like, oh, that's something that, yeah, I guess that, that's either, or, or feel like, wait, no, that, you're seeing that, but that's, I don't see that there. Is that a disconnect that's happening in the poem productively or is that something that I need to edit and of poems they fit in and these other poems kind of fit around it and that's the shape of the book like those poems had to come out for the 
the poems in this book to come together in a positive shape rather than like a negative shape. And so, yeah, so that, so, um, and then, and then I had several, several workshops and fellow peers and professors reading it and helping it with order. And then um, my editor at Rescue Press, who's great, um, kind of put together the final order of the poems. And um, I really liked the way she put them, but, but yeah. <laughs> So that, that's how it came together, very much not in the beginning, not thinking of it as a book, and then realizing because somebody else told me it was a book, and then seeing it and reading it through and thinking, yeah, this is a book. Senior, as you go from your MFA to your PhD, can your professors really add anything? And what you're obviously they can't increase your personal health. What can they add to help you as in your progress? And what does the PhD, the PhD represent you? Is that more a matter of employability or professorships at all your time? Employability. Close your ears. <laughs> the PhD I went into after I did my MFA because I want I was like I need to read more. I need to if I'm gonna be serious about writing, I need to read more. And wow, here's a place where I get six years of paid time with really smart people to read. That sounds great. I mean, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then also in my program, um, I've been fortunate to work with um, this poet Jory Graham who's been, who leads a workshop every spring. And so actually, it's kept me really honest about writing. And there's other peers in the program who are great writers. And, it's, and, um, and I keep up with friends from all over writing. Um, so, so the PhD, it's, um, I went into it with that mindset. It's funny to try to maintain that mindset there, but that always feels like the base of it is like, okay, I really want a place to think and explore. And, and then I discovered also, I really lo love writing um, certain kinds of prose as well, and I don't think I would have discovered that in a very, um, in a really sustained way if I hadn't decided to go for a sustained number of years into the PhD. I'm going to invite you to have some refreshments with us and you'll be able to talk to you more. Thank you. Um, but we'll kind of move on to the sort of room, <laughs> out to that room, and you can have something to eat at the same time, and some wine if you wish. Um, Adrian, thank you again. Thank you, Sarah.